Superman actor Dean Cain joins the show to talk about faith, Hollywood, and so much more. And we've also got Pastor Jesse Bradley of Grace Community Church out in Washington to share an amazing outreach opportunity and the power of prayer. Lots to talk about on today's Higher Ground. I'm Billy Hollowell, and I want to get into Jesse Bradley's story first. Now, he is an interesting pastor. He's always out there talking about culture, where things are, what we can be doing to improve our lives and our walks with God. And Jesse today joins the show to talk about a variety of things, 2024, revival, what we can expect to happen both in the church and in our own individual hearts. But most importantly, he talks about an incredible outreach, a step of faith his church took in their community and the incredible things that have resulted from it. And we'll also be having on Dean Cain to talk all about his career, his faith, and why he's so vocal about politics, religion, and more. With no further ado, let's welcome Jesse Bradley to the show. Jesse Bradley, always love having you on with me. And I've got to tell you, it has been a crazy 12 months. We are now in 2024. And we're going to talk about a number of things today with the new year. But I want to start with the state of the culture, the state of the church. When you look at America, a lot of things are going wrong. You know, culture is devolving in so many areas, but at the same time, the word revival was thrown around so much last year. And I'm not even, I guess I'll stop there. I want to get your perspective. What do you think is going on right now and what's going to happen moving into this new year? I think we all have a sense that we're living in a very defining time right now. And there's a lot of tectonic plates that are shifting on many levels in that spiritual, moral. The church, it's a unique time when you think about it's never been the situation that less than half Americans have a house of worship. These are the lowest numbers ever in terms of physically going to church. And yet digital ministry is taking off. We're seeing revival on college campuses through some movies, record numbers of baptisms. It's really a both and. If people say, is there a deterioration? Absolutely. Is there more chaos? Yes. And at the same time, is God moving powerfully? 100%. I think of that scripture, you know, God doesn't give us a spirit of timidity. And a lot of people right now are a little scared. They're a little worried. We know we have the Bible. You turn to the last chapter, turn to the last book, be encouraged. You know how the story ends. And when you have that eternal security, then you don't have to have fear and timidity in the times we're living in. I'm so grateful to be alive today. I believe this is one of the most important times in terms of the history of the church in America in our response right now to the current situation in the world. And I think there's so much potential. So yes, we're seeing revival in that word, but we don't just want the word. We want the reality of it. And to get there, there's going to be some shifts that need to happen. I think it starts with the heart and then it moves to the home. And then the church is next. And the church is key in scripture. Local churches, I get every week, I'm asked the question, how important is church? I talk to someone, I don't go to church at all. Is that okay? Local churches, this is God's plan. He lays it out in different cities, elders. And so whatever your vision is, my encouragement right now is don't be scared. God gives the spirit of power and love, loving people, seeing God's power, and then be involved in a local church. Find a church home where you serve. And the vision of the churches, the health of the churches, we need to make some shifts. And we can dive into some of that. But overall, like, I'm encouraged. I believe we're made for a time like this. And I think it's time to not retreat, be silent, be intimidated, be fearful. It's time to find our voice, to roll up our sleeves, to live out our faith, and to rise up. I'll I'll add this last statement. The church should be the most hope-filled place in America. Right now, people are starving for hope, and they're going to movies or entertainment, games. They're going to the bar. We want churches to be the place, like, you need some hope? Where do you find hope these days? Well, you go to church, and that's where you experience the presence of God. Well, and and what you're saying is so true, because one of the things that I think has led to these revival moments, you have churches saying they've never baptized so many people, and you had you know, over 4,100 people show up at one mass baptism in California. And a few weeks later, 4,500 people, both of which were historic showings. And of course, we want to be careful with numbers because numbers are numbers, right? As you were saying, reality is reality. But the point is, I think we've seen people step into 
this interest in faith because the culture has been lying to people, right? This is how you, you know, get, get truth. You find truth in yourself and all these things that we know are not true. They've been peddled as true. And so people are a little bit desperate and they're looking for what is going to give them that hope and they're finding it. And so it's time for us to all lean into that as the church. But one thing I do want to hit on, because I do see it a lot among Christians, obviously a lot in culture, is fear. This issue of fear creeping in, and we're in a new year. A lot of us have all sorts of resolutions we've made, um, but but fear is not one we often think of. You know, having less fear. Why is it important? And this may seem like common sense, but I think we need to dive into it for Christians in particular to not live in a bubble of fear. That's right, because there is more openness, and there's also more opposition in the culture. And whenever there's opposition, people either shrink back or they step up. And when you read in the Bible, Acts chapter 5, I'm inspired. Here you have a situation in Jerusalem where they fill Jerusalem with the gospel. Every man, woman, and child is hearing about Jesus. How does this happen? Well, it happens in the middle of a lot of opposition and chaos and violence. And, of course, there's going to be people killed. I mean, it's intense when you read the history of the early church. And what do we find? That the followers of Jesus, they care more about honoring and obeying and glorifying God than they do about the opinions and even the restrictions that are placed on them. And when you really get down to the heart of it in Acts chapter 5, we see that they're sharing the gospel, that Jesus Christ died for our sins and he's risen. This is through grace. This is a relationship with God. The gospel's central. Also, we see that they are relying on the Holy Spirit. I think that's the shift when it comes to fear, is we've got to move away from self-reliance, and we need to say, yes, we need God. And a lot of times in America, we put our trust in our experience, our gifts, our technology, our methods, and we're the same as the early church. We need the Holy Spirit. And with reliance on the Holy Spirit, there's also a radical obedience. This radical obedience includes taking risks, stepping out of our comfort zone, relationship risks, putting words out there, asking people questions, listening well. Whatever the cost is, whatever the results are, we're going to trust God. We just want to be faithful. And you know what? The vision has always been, let's reach our cities. And sometimes churches lose that. Not only individuals, but churches. They lose a vision or a belief that we can bring the good news with radical faithfulness, with the power of the Holy Spirit, and see the culture, see our cities transform for Christ. And listen, God's going to do the changing of lives and the saving of lives. We can't do that. But we have a calling that's significant. And fear is not going to get it done. Halfway, half-hearted, it's not going to get it done. When you think back, this image has always stood out to me in Scripture. They had a temple, and it was Solomon who built it. A lot of bling. It was, wow, incredible building. And then what happened? Exile, rebellion. In a lot of ways, America experiencing some exile right now in terms of faith and wandering. And like, we need to return to God. It's always a good decision to return to God. Well, when they return, they rebuild in the prophet Haggai, You can read about Zerubbabel. They rebuild the temple, and there's some crying when the temple's rebuilt because it's like, oh, it doesn't look like it used to look like. (laughs) Listen, God does new work, new songs, new seasons. New wine doesn't fit in old wineskins. And you say, how could this second temple be better than the first temple? And the later glory is the greater glory. Why? God's presence is going to be there, and Jesus is going to step into that temple. It doesn't have the same bling as Solomon's. And I think that shift right there, a shift out of fear to courage, a shift out of buildings to people, empowering people, a shift out of just the form of religion to the presence of God. And the churches that are going to thrive right now are the ones that the presence of God, that's what they're all about, God's presence in God's word. And it's not going to matter denomination, age, how many years you've been in church. It's going to be who's hungry for God, who's humble, who's willing to say yes to God and take those risks and then move beyond the walls of the church. We've always had prayer in our church. This last two years, we started to do drive-through prayer, and we go to the busiest city in our, in, it's a street that's tons of traffic, thousands of people in our city, and we hold up signs, drive-through prayer. People from the community are pulling in, and they're asking, can I pay for it? No, this is free. No, they'll just share their stories. A wait a minute, so you guys, wait a minute, so you guys, you go to a busy area as a church, You have a sign that says, I just want to recap this because I didn't know this about your ministry. And you guys offer people who are driving by prayer. And how frequent is it that people stop and take you up on it, would you say? 
Well, it's offered every week, Friday nights, and people pull in, people come to know Jesus. A little six-year-old boy two weeks ago told his mom, we've got to pull in. And then pulled in, and he didn't know Jesus yet. Of course, we asked the mom, can we share about Jesus? Yes. And the six-year-old boy said, I want to put my trust in Christ right there. We're seeing people come to know Jesus, sharing prayer requests. One man was on his way. He just had a fight with his wife on his way to the casino. He pulled in. These are people who don't go to our church. And pulled in and said, I, I need prayer. I just had a huge fight with my wife. Instead of going to the casino and gambling and trying to numb that pain, he said, I need to go home and make things right. I'm telling you, if you go to where people are, and that's true digitally on your phone. I mean, Billy, you're doing all kinds of stuff, podcasts, interviews, stories. As a church, we always want to welcome people. And we, we person live in person is always the best. But it often starts by going to where people are, offering prayer, live streaming services, going on to networks where maybe you don't usually talk about Jesus. God has given everyone platforms. God is empowering people between social media, YouTube channels, texting people, your phone, where you live, work, learn, or play, your neighborhoods, coworkers. God has brought thousands of people into your life. It's not an accident. And if you just say, yes, Lord, I will bless these people. I will pray for them, listen to them, eat meals with them, serve them, find out their story, share my story, share about Jesus, invite them to church. If you take those risks, God is going to transform lives. And we've been doing the drive through prayer with another church, so collaboration is key. And then also, now there's some other churches that are doing it, and even a church in Texas just started doing it. So there's all kinds of creative ways. If you are filled and have that overflowing hope, you're going to find opportunities. You're going to be creative. Our God is creative. And go where did that idea God. come from? Like, where did you guys, how did that idea originate to do this? It started with COVID and all of the challenges. How do we connect with people? People are hurting. People are looking for hope. Half of America feels hopeless. And we thought, well, what if we opened up our parking lot and said drive through prayer and people could start coming in from the community? And that's what happens. And we then saw the fruit that they started to then show up at church and then they got involved in small groups, becoming members. Like, how do you hear about the church? And it's done a number of things. It's inspired other Christians because they hear it and they're like, we need to take some risks. We need to get out into our community, think beyond our four walls, have a bigger vision. And as that happens, even our church, now we say Grace Community Church, and like, oh, is that the church where you have the drive through prayer? So when you do one thing, it's like in the Bible, you give God your five loaves of bread, your two fish, and then God just starts to multiply. God calls us to do small things, and then he does a great work through it so that he gets all the glory. But I do think prayer is going to be key in America. If we humble ourselves, we turn from sin, we pray, we pray in our homes, we pray with each other, not just for each other. I have in my family very few Christians, and I've been surprised before meals if I say, how about we pray? They're like, yes. Or sometimes they'll say, can you put me on your prayer list? Right. They, they'll say, I don't believe in God, but can you put me on your prayer list? Because <laughs> people want prayer. it. They want there's something in people. Right. And I, I mean, we know this as believers that God puts that in us. It's like a magnet and you can resist it. But there's something there. That's incredible, though, for somebody who doesn't believe in prayer to say, put me on your prayer list right? or doesn't believe in God to say that. You know, but I'm blown away. I, I'm blown away by what you and your church have done when you do these outreaches. As you can tell, I'm obsessed with this story. I think it's so interesting. When you, how many of you go out from the church on a Friday night to, to do the prayer? There's usually a group of, let's say, a dozen people or so that are ready to pray with people, some to stand on the streets. I mean, I love this team. are so devoted. Winter, rain, whatever, cold temperatures, snow, they're out there. I mean, I've been out there just holding a sign before, and it's, it's kind of interesting just to hold a sign, drive through prayer, and watch everyone go by. And many, you know, just take a look. You get this eye contact with people, some honk. Some might flip you off. I mean, there's a range of reactions, but you're just trying to represent Jesus and humbly say, we want to invite you here. And that's, I think, something we, the posture we want to take. And, and that's, God's already called us priests, already called us ambassadors. We don't earn that online degree. No, you're already that. And what does that mean? That means where God's placed you, you're already praying for people. You're already finding out, how can I care for you? How can I pray for you? What are your needs? How can I serve you? And really, that small event, in one sense, it changes the culture, which is the most important thing. And it starts to change our posture. And now it's not just for a couple hours on Friday night, 
but it's how we live throughout the week. And we're doing a digital prayer wall with our community now where we set it up. This is brand new. We're just launching it this week. And people from the community can join in. They can put in their prayer requests. They can um, be prayed for. They can have conversations there. And what we're doing physically with the drive through prayer, now we're doing digitally with this prayer wall that invites the community into. So we want to connect with people. Prayer is just one way to do that, but it's a powerful way. And it's like Damar Hamlin. Remember when during the Bills game, uh, all yeah. of a sudden he had the cardiac arrest? What happened? ESPN started to pray. People were praying on that secular station. Football players, both teams were praying. We just know deep down that we need God and we need to return to God. We need to cry out to God. We need to drop our pride. It's hard to pray and and carry a lot of pride. So let's all humble ourselves and seek God together. When we're talking about America changing and revival, we're talking about a work of the Holy Spirit. We're talking about something supernatural. This is not just a couple of personalities or denominations. Like we need God's presence to move And throughout scripture, I don't know any better way than entering with prayer and then let's get filled with the Holy Spirit and let's let God lead us instead of us trying to lead God and tell him to bless us. Let's just trust God and move forward, not with fear, but with courage and unity. That would be refreshing, full of hope, the hope of Jesus. There's no greater hope. God's not running low on hope these days. You know, you might read the news and think, oh, Headline after headline, God isn't running out of hope. He still wants and can fill his people with hope, overflowing hope. It's relational, it's available, it's indestructible. That's our Jesus. That's who we're trusting these days. Well, Jesse Bradley, as always, love having you on. Love that inspiration. We all need to start with prayer as we journey through this new year. Thanks for your time today. Billy, let's keep going bold for Jesus in 2024. And I believe this is a year where we can see incredible stories happen for the glory of God. All right, a lot to discern there. Really powerful discussion about faith and stepping out in faith. I love that they just went out to a busy area, held up signs and offered prayer and people took them up on it. It's a testament, not only to our internal quest for something bigger and deeper, but also the willingness that people have to engage when we step out in our own faith and make a simple offer to them to show love through prayer. Pretty powerful stuff. Now, our next interview is Dean Cain. You know him from Superman, God's Not Dead, lots of other films and shows. He's here today to talk about his faith, but also Hollywood and what it's like to be a conservative in Hollywood. With no further ado, let's welcome Dean Cain to Higher Ground. So, Dean, you have had an incredibly long career in Hollywood, which is which is sort of a rarity. What what keeps you going in the industry? Did you just call me old? I did not. I did not call you old. I said you had a, a long career. Those are different things. Um, you know, I'm a worker. I work hard. Uh, I have a. I come in prepared. I have a good attitude. I do my job. I don't cause any trouble. And uh, and that's it. I mean, I think that's so important. Um, I know when to close my mouth and 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 do what I'm supposed to do. So I'm a professional. Um, if if I get hired, you know, I'm going to be come in prepared. I'll be on time. And, uh, in this business that that's, that's job one. Um, and they know, and people know that I'm going to come in and, and do my job and not cause trouble and get out of there. Yeah. I mean, you're a hard, you're a hard worker. You're also somebody in your private life or public life, I guess, but outside of acting, you know, you've spoken up about the things you believe in faith, you know, some, some politics here or there. What is it like being in the industry as a, as a Christian, as a conservative, what is it like? I guess I guess the ideology is that that's a different way of thinking than most of Hollywood. So how do you how do you navigate that? Well, I think it's just frowned upon in Hollywood. It's like you know I even tell people if I, if I were a young actor just beginning, I'd probably keep my mouth shut. You know, just because people, to, you know, I, I'll work with anybody. I, I disagree politically with you know Rob Reiner and and uh, um, and 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 De Niro and guys like that, but I'd work with them in a heartbeat. They're extremely talented filmmakers and people and um that i think that's the that vibrance that's vibrant when you have people who can disagree and have a conversation that's always the answer more speech not less speech and so um but but there are a lot of people who just won't it gets tribalized so much in hollywood and then people just won't they won't want to work with somebody you know they 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 consider me because i'll talk about being a christian or uh, you know and they'll say you know gosh i can't can't have him on the on the set because he'll cause trouble i'm like you didn't get any trouble from me. 
I mean, if you ask opinion, I'll give you an opinion, but I mean, uh, it, it's just an odd thing. And so people like to stay in their echo chambers. Sometimes they get comfortable with it, especially these days with the internet, because everybody loves to pile on and, and they, they just pile on somebody if they disagree with them and they attack them personally. And I think that's a, that's a very dangerous game. That cancel culture stuff is a very dangerous game. Um, you know, you need to be held to account for the things you say, but you know, the things that I say are, you know, are, are really historically not very controversial, <laughs> but, but, uh, today in today's age, uh, with the current zeitgeist, you know, they've got kids and people thinking differently. Yeah. Well, no, it's crazy. And, and to your point, the ability to, to agree, to disagree and to be friends with people who are different. I mean, this seems like common sense and yet. It's not just Hollywood. It feels like nobody can do that anywhere now. There's no interest in doing it. And yet I've often found for me, I mean, I live in New York, right? So I live in New York and I'm like an evangelical Christian conservative in New York. And so I would have no friends if I didn't talk to people who were different, right? I mean, like that's just, so it's second nature to me. But, uh, you know, for you, though, you know, being in the industry, you do continue to, to speak out about the things you believe. Are there ever times where you're like, maybe I shouldn't or I'm, I'm going to pull back or like how do you what what keeps you speaking out i guess well there's a saying you know this one and and i'm sure you've heard it a million times there you may not be interested in politics but i promise you politics is interested in you and i explained this to my son who's 23 you know he's a college kid he's trying to find his way you know and you you look at what's happening with the college kids today and the way they're sort of indoctrinated and they're saying things that they literally have no understanding of what they're standing for or, or what, what things they are saying. So it's really frightening. So I'll have this conversation with him and, and his and his peers. And I say, look, you know, um, wh- what, like, if you look at this current conflict, you know, the war in, in Israel and, and in Gaza and what's going on with Hamas, it's so clear. Like, what, what, what is the problem? You can look, you can look through and, and, and go through every point and explain to them, you know, that Israel and is and the Jews have always been on that land. Um, that Hamas is a terrorist organization and has no interest in peace. They they love death and they 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 make them the, the those who die there uh, as martyrs and and they think that's the highest achievement you can get. And the Jews love life and the sanctity of life. And then you look at this terrorist attack on October seventh, and you go through everything like that, and then you hear somebody. Some college kid go, yeah, but they're an occupied land and it's okay. They haven't seen that footage of what these people have done. They haven't experienced it. They don't have any idea what they're talking about. And history will not look kindly upon that because it's embarrassing. It doesn't look, history doesn't look kindly upon, you know, the Nazis and the concentration camps and Auschwitz, which I've visited with my son and seen everything and studied it, you know, and I just look at this, what's happening now. And I go, this is impossible. There's no way they say, you know, the one way for evil to prevail is for good men to stand around and do nothing. Well, at this point in time in my life, in my career, I have to speak up because it's common sense. And if it's right and wrong and and, and if that hurts me in my in my business or my life, well, then there's no sense in this world, you know? Yeah. So I have to speak up. And as a, what are they- as a role model for my son, I'm sorry. No, no, I'm sorry. I mean, I'm interrupting, but like, what are they teaching these kids, right? Like- you look at it and you think, what? Well, how did we? How did we get to this place where you're watching almost immediately college students and adults, by the way, going out into the streets and supporting Hamas? Essentially, not everybody that was protesting was doing that, but but some of them were. I mean, you just oh, very much what is going on. It's 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 a brainwashing because no person could look at what happened to these young people at, at that at that music festival and who were full of people who were. Who literally were preaching peace between the you know, Palestinians and, and 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 people in Gaza and, and Israel? Let's work together. Wonderful. Let's have peace. And so many of those people were actually advocates for for um, the Palestinians who are locked in Gaza and who are prisoners in an open air prison because of Hamas, not because of Israel. You know, they're on the border. They have a border to the south with with another Arab country called Egypt. Why is that closed? It's not Israel. Israel isn't doing that, uh, and the West Bank—they're not an open-air prison either, because they have a—they have a, a, a predominantly Palestinian population just to their uh, east, called Jordan, which is seventy percent at least Palestinian. So these people aren't locked in. The, the the people who who are leading Hamas are billionaires, and they're not in—they're not in Gaza. You know, they're in Qatar, they're in Turkey, they're in Iran. 
and they're reading this from there. And so when you start breaking it down for people and show them that, that, that this is crazy and you talk about the unrest schools and the things like that, and they just teach hate. One thing I've gone through is like, hate isn't natural. If you took a little Palestinian baby, a little Arab baby, and, and a little Jewish baby, and you know, a, a Mexican baby, a Japanese baby, a black baby, put everybody in one little room and raised them together, they'd be brothers. Yep. And that's because that's what they're taught. But when they're taught hate, and when they're taught to hate a a race or a religion or or tall people or short people or men or women or whatever it is, that is the danger. And that's what the, these young people are. They're just getting it. And nobody's pushing back on it. I don't know. This Mar Marxism is horrific. Study it. Look at it. And then think about, you know, I mean, <laughs> the, the beauty, here's, here it is summed up in one thing. When you see, um, you know, gays for Palestine, if you want, if you want to be gay in, in Gaza, um, they're going to kill you or you're going to spend 10 years in prison. How you can advocate that, everybody jokes about it. It's like chicken... Chickens for Kentucky Fried Chicken. It just it doesn't work. You know, it, it's crazy. So um, people just need to be educated and they're not being educated correctly. And I'm not quite sure what the agenda is, if it's the George Soros's of the world doing that or if it's these Marxists in education. But that's why I speak up, because these words need to be heard from people who were, you know, they say politics are downstream from culture. Well, I work in the culture world. I make movies. I make television shows. Um, so I want my voice to, to speak for truth. And I, and I stand by everything I've said. I've made documentaries two years ago, three years ago, five years ago, time passes. <laughs> um, I made a, uh, a documentary called hate among us and we won an Emmy for that. And that was great. And it talked about the rise of anti-Semitism, um, in, in Europe and here in, in, in the United States. And it warned that it's growing and it's getting more dangerous because it's being taught and hate is taught. And then what happens? This, um, and I, I wish we had been wrong. Uh, I wish we had sounded the alarm for, for seemingly nothing. But when you look at what's going on now in these protests and people marching, thousands of people, and it, it, it's really frightening. That's why I think it's so important for young people to really understand what they're talking about and really pay attention. Because uh, I, I think, you know, and question authority. We were taught to question authority, question those who are teaching us. Uh, nowadays, if you do that, you're thrown out. And that's a problem. Yeah. You know, question whatever you're hearing. Right. And you arrive at the truth when you have a chance to do that, to, to vet the details, to say, is this really true? That's not the world we're living in, though. Hollywood media universities, they are selling one narrative and we're watching, I think, the fruits of that. And they're very spoiled fruits right now unfold. And I have to ask you also, because I know that you left California, which is really fascinating. Um, and you and you moved out. Uh, talk about that a little bit. What drove you out of California? Yeah. <sighs> I thought it, there was no way in the world I would ever leave Malibu, California. It's it's a paradise. Greatest weather in the world. Beautiful open air. It's just so lovely. Um, thank you, God, for that place. However, I used to say this when I would look at San Diego and then Tijuana right next to it. I'd say, what's the difference between San Diego, vibrant, thriving economy, gorgeous and lovely, and then Tijuana, which is a border town, just like San Diego is, but run down, very, very poor, crime, et cetera, et cetera. The difference is government. The difference is government. And the government in California uh, has lost its mind. It's gone, it's gone crazy. It's gone insane, in my opinion. With the amount of regulation, the, uh, the huge amount of taxes. I mean, I fought a custody battle in California for, for joint custody of my son. Um, and one of the laws that they're trying to pass now in California was, you know, if you don't, if you're in a custody case and you don't affirm your child's um, gender, um, yep. I'm sorry, not even gender, identity, yes. then yeah. then you could lose custody of your child and they could take that child or they'd award it to the other parent. My son, um, when he was little, wanted to be a bird. I didn't dress him up in bird costumes. I didn't put feathers in his hair. Um, but I bet you they'd try to use that against me. And it sounds ridiculous, but this stuff happens. Oh, it's yeah. as ridiculous as saying your boy is a girl. Um, so all these things in California and the taxes, oh my gosh, you know, there's, I, I moved to Nevada. There's no personal income tax, no state income tax. That saves me 13% off the top. Just chop it off the top. I mean, your taxes should be no higher than 13%. I mean, I, they, period. When I, when I used to feed my son, I would make him breakfast in the morning and then, you know, I made breakfast. So I go up tax and I would take a bite and he's, what, he's like, what is that? What is this taxing? Why are you doing? I'm like, 
if your dad makes a dollar, how much do you think I take home? And he's like, a dollar. I go, no, man. Wow. I meant less than half. He's like, what? I'm like, yeah, taxes. That's where my money goes into taxes. But so in California, you're getting you're getting hit on the personal income tax. You're getting hit on gas tax, energy tax, clean air tax. Boom, 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 boom. Any tax the government puts in, they never get rid of. Um, so it's getting absolutely ridiculous there. And I said, you know, I've had enough of this. Um, and my parents, I, they moved out to Nevada a year and a half before I did. And um, they were really enjoying it. And um, life seemed pretty good. Plus, they're getting older. I said, you know what? I think I should be out there. And my son agreed. He's like, let's, yeah, there's nothing for me to do here in Malibu. You know, I can't go to any concerts. If you go to SoFi Stadium, so go see something, it takes three hours to get there to park. You know, it's just a nightmare. So um, we moved out here to Nevada, and everything about it is fan. Fantastic. I mean, the, the your dollar goes so much further. The home we moved into is 10 times the house for a significantly less money um, than my Malibu place. And it's just everything about it. I feel like I'm cheating and they're going to come get me and they're going to be like, oh, you got to come back here and do this. Um, I, I've been, you know, you do work in my business and, you know, everybody's like, well, you know, you, you know, you do a series and everybody's like, oh, you have enough money for the rest of your life. No, you don't. You do not, especially when it's your first big series. I won't do a series now because I wanted to be a, a parent and it's, I don't want to work on a set 18 hours a day. I want to have some balance in my life. And that's why I haven't done that. But, but, you know, you got to be smart with your money because that money's not going to come in every week or every month or every year. Like it did when you're doing a series, you're, you're, you're paying for that with your time. Um, I chose to be a father. I wanted to be a present father to my son. Uh, I've been smart with my money. I've done very well in real estate with my money, um, which I've been very careful. My real estate, you know, decisions have been very smart. I uh, Genesis Gold Group is a gold yeah, group I work with. They're fantastic. I'm, just, I'm I'm going for longevity, and that's why that's why that Princeton degree, that Princeton football helmet over there, means something. Um, I was I was taught a lot of smart things back in the day before it started turning a little bit too uh, politically liberal. We'll get it. We can get into that later. Well, let's let's talk about Genesis Gold Group because yeah. it's interesting. You know, right now everybody's they're all into Bitcoin and all these other things, and yet you know you're kind of you're looking at things a little bit differently here. Talk about your your work with them. Well, listen, I don't understand the cryptocurrency stuff because I can't figure out what's behind it, what backs it. It feels like it's this ether thing, and then you look at a guy like Sam Bankman-Fried, who you know is donating billions of dollars right around. You know, it's just, it feels like just, it's, 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 it's monopoly money. It's not even real. So I don't understand what that is. Even the U S dollar coming off the gold standard, like what backs the United States currency? Nothing. Now it's a fiat currency. It doesn't, there's nothing there. So, so our government can just print and, and under this current administration, what have they done? They have printed trillions of dollars. And when they print money, it makes your cash worth less. So I was looking at, you know, what what kind of investments are smart? You know, you look at the people who are who are really wealthy. They're making investments, and they're that's capitalism, and it makes great sense. You're risking money to do things, but you know, getting into real estate, I've been, I've owned and, and sold you know nine nine ten properties, and it's been wonderful for me along the way. But then, what do you do? Do you invest in the stock market? I've been doing that for a long time. I watch it go up and down, this way that way. Um, you hold on to cash. D does that work out for you? Well, my sister, I created an IRA for her. 20, 30 years ago, did really well for a while, but would go up and down. In the last few years, she called me and she goes, hey, my IRA is dry. It's becoming worth less. Uh, and I go, yeah, well, that's because they keep printing money. That's inflation. When inflation's coming along, that's a tax on everybody. And I said, okay, Christina, that's my sister's name, Christina. And I took this 1924 gold coin that I have, $20 gold piece. And I explained it like this. I said, okay, well, I mean, I said in, 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 in 1924, this $20 gold piece could buy the nicest tailored suit made. Phenomenal. Also, a $20 bill could have bought that suit. Today, a $20 bill will, will buy you, uh, you know, two cups of coffee at Starbucks. Yeah. But this same 1924 gold co coin here will still buy you the nicest tailored suit there is. Because gold holds its value, precious metals. So I tried to explain to her: you can turn your IRA into um, into uh, you know holdings of precious metals. Whether you want to hold it on your, I like to hold my own, but everybody has their own way of doing so. Um, and, and for me, I, it's this it's the smartest thing 
to do. If you look at like, think, and I don't quote me on this, but it's somewhere in the ballpark. And if you're at home watching this, do your own research on it. I think since 19 or since 2000, since my son has been on this planet, um, the buying power of the dollar has decreased like 35% or something, but the buying power of gold has increased like 500%. What's now I'm mean? no mathematician, Billy, but those numbers, that buying power seems to mean something to me. And, and, and you got to be smart. And on top of it, in this, in this day and age, and, and that's been something that's been very, very effective for me. Yeah, so it's Genesis Gold Group. And I got to tell you, you're a jack of all trades because we've hit on everything from Israel to gold to your career in Hollywood to you vacating California. And we got to have you back again sometime very soon. Appreciate your time today. I would love to, my friend. It's great talking to you always. That's all for today's Higher Ground. Be sure to tune in next week for another episode of the show and head on over to the Washington Times and Higher Ground for daily news, content, video podcasts, and more. I'll see you again next week.